So, um, we actually talked about the trichotomy axiom in uh, Algebra 1 last period, but remember either two things are either equal to each other, less than, or greater than, right? So there's one of the three things. So the symbols we use are less than, greater than, less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to. Um, but when you're dealing with linear inequalities, linear, remember, means a straight line. So in inequality, so instead of something like this, y equals negative 3x plus 5, well, if I were to graph that, it would look like this. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's where the y-intercept is, right? And then negative 3 over 1. So that means I'm going down 3 over 1, down 3 over 1, down 3 over 1. So the inequality, or the graph of this equation would look like this, right? So y equals negative 3x plus 5. This is in slope-intercept form, so it looks like this. Now, if I did an inequality, then it would look like this. Why, if it was y is greater than or equal to negative 3x plus 5, it would be everything on the line because it's equal to that line, but it'd be greater than that line. Well, what's greater than this line? Everything above it. So you would shade everything above it. So remember when we graphed inequalities like this, greater than or equal to one on a number line, well, we had a one here, and then we shaded it in, and then we, and then we shaded to the right of it, right? Same kind of thing here, except in the two-dimensional version of it. So you're greater than or equal to, so you're shading the line itself because it's equal to the line and everything greater than the line. So greater than in this case is above the line, all right? Because Y measures up or down, right? So if, if it's greater than that line, then up or down, what, the, what does that mean up or down? In up or down language, it means up. It means on top of the line, okay? Um, well, there's another way to do this where it's maybe not too taxing on your mind, but we'll come back to this method because this is the better way to do it. But let's, let's do some examples of just some, um, just figuring out if something's a solution or not. And you can always check this to see if it's the solution because technically, if you look at the, the Let's see if uh, zero, zero is part of this. If you plug in zero, zero into this line, you get zero is greater than or equal to negative three times zero plus five, so that's five. Is zero greater than or equal to five? No, so the origin shouldn't be shaded. So that's a good way to check to see if you shaded it correctly. So just pick a point that's either part of the shading or not part of the shading and see if it works in your equation, okay? So some of your homework would look like this. So here's example 1a is you want to, uh, let's see here. Let's see if 2, 9 is a solution. Okay, well, you can look at the graph and it looks like two nine should be two nine over two up nine. That should be part of the shading part, right? So, but let's plug it in to make sure. So let's put two, two in for X and nine in for Y. So this is negative six plus five is negative one and nine is greater than or equal to negative one. Yes, that's true. Yes. So yes, it is a solution. So that's example 1a. Let's one let's figure out 1b. Is negative 3, negative 7 a solution? Well, you could probably already tell by looking on the graph here. Negative 3, negative 7 is down here. So this technically should not be a solution, right? Well, let's just make sure. Plug in negative 3 for x. So I get 
and negative seven for y. So negative seven is greater than or equal to negative three times x, which is negative three plus five. Negative seven, greater than or equal to nine plus five. No, this is false. It is not a solution. And we knew that because it doesn't look like it's part of that shading, okay? So I, I demonstrated the shading first. We're gonna get to that in a second, but um, you're really just determining if something is a solution or not. So we're gonna skip example 1C and let's move to, um, let's move to the next part here. So this is just, this is just doing the same thing we just did in a different way, okay? So look at, uh, you don't have your book, but um, let me just read this paragraph because it's interesting and it's something that we didn't talk about in Algebra 1. Um, so the graph of a linear equation in two variables is a set of all points that satisfy the inequality like we already talked about. So to graph it, you have to graph the related linear equation. So it's just like graphing the equation normally. So if it's in slope intercept form, it's nice because it gives you the intercept, where to start, and then the slope, which direction to go, okay? So that's nice. Or you could do it the old fashioned way, pick some points and graph them like that, okay? So um, to make the line, the dash. So here's the, the, tick, the trick is whether it's greater than or equal to. If it's not, when I did something like this, if it was, if I wanted to graph this inequality on the number line, well, what would I do at the three? Well, I don't put a dot it's greater than three, so it can't be three. So I have to put like an everything but symbol and have an open circle. Well, how do you do that on a line? How do you do that on a line if it's just greater than negative three X plus five? Well, here's five. And then negative three X, well, I can't put a circle around the line. So what do we do? we do a dotted line. And we still shade on top of it like that, but it's a dotted line, okay? So that dotted line is kind of the two-dimensional equivalent of this open circle on the number line, okay? So if it's just greater than, you have to put a dotted line. So don't make the line yet, unless you have your eraser handy and you can make it dots later. But when you graph the line, you have to pay attention to the symbol. If, it's, if there's a line under it, then you can just graph the line normally, put a line. Or if it's, there's not a line, you need to make it a dotted line, okay? So here's what it says. Make the line dashed when the symbol is less than or greater than, and solid when it's less than or equal to or greater than or equal to. This line is the boundary line. So it's either dotted or it's not. It separates the plane into two half planes. Okay, there are two half planes. The one that is the, the, the solutions and one that's not the solutions. So these are the two half planes. There's only two, one on one side of the line and one on the other side of the line. So you have to determine which half you're supposed to shade. Okay, well, I, I already did a little spoiler alert for here. It's greater than, so it's above the line. So sometimes it's hard to tell when it's above the line. Like if it's completely vertical, then that's not gonna make sense and it's gonna be weird and it's not even gonna be a Y, okay? But usually you can tell what's above the line and what's not. So if you imagine this as a road, what's on top of the road, what's on top, what's on the bottom of the road. If you can't imagine it as a road, then it's not a Y is greater than or less than, anyway, it's an X is something. So don't worry about that. We'll talk about that in a little bit, okay? So example two just kind of goes through another way to do this. I'm gonna skip to a new page here. It says graph this equation, three Y plus X, is greater than or equal to negative nine. And then you can just make a table of values, okay? So you could do that if you wanted to. Um, I would just rather put this in slope intercept form. 
but let's do this. Let's pick some easy ones. Let's say y is zero. If y is zero, then that completely gets rid of that term. So x has to be a negative nine. And this is just assuming that they're equal. So we're gonna graph these points first, okay? Assuming that these are equal. Okay, let's see if x was, if y is like negative three, then x could be zero because that would make this negative nine plus zero is equal to negative nine, okay? So now I've got two points. I can graph that right now if I wanted to. Negative nine, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine is right there. Zero, negative three is right here. Okay, so here's my line and it's greater than or equal to. So I'm gonna make that solid. Okay, so now I have to determine whether to graph on top of the line or on the bottom of the line. Now it's not in slope intercept form, so you can't technically know yet, but I'm guessing it's on top since all I have to do is to get it in slope intercept form is bring this X over and divide by three. And that doesn't change the, the symbol at all. Remember what reverses the symbol is multiplying or dividing by a negative number, but we're not doing that. But here's what the book says. The book says, just pick a point. Let's say, let's say, pick point zero, zero. Let's see if zero, zero satisfies this, equa this equation. So if I plug in zero, zero, I get three times zero plus zero is greater than or equal to negative nine. So zero plus zero. Is zero plus zero greater than or equal to negative nine? Yes. So that means I'm going to shade that side of the line. Okay, so let's do, and that's it, and you're done. Okay, so zero, zero is always the easiest line to pick, or point to pick, unless it's on the line. So if the line goes through the origin, then obviously you can't pick zero, zero to see if you should shade on the top or the bottom of the line, right? Because it's on the line. So you just have to pick another point, like one, one or something like that. Something easy that doesn't make it too difficult, but zero, zero is always nice because it, it's the easiest math. All right, so this all brings us to the way that is probably the fastest way to do this, is just put it in slope intercept form and uh, determine whether it's above or below the line based on the inequality symbol. Okay, so here is example 3a. I want to graph this. Graph 5y plus x is less than 20. Okay, well, can we do this in our head? I think we can. So bring the x over there and becomes a negative x and then divide everything by 5. So y is less than or equal to 1 fifth, negative 1 fifth x plus do I need to do those steps out? Let's do the steps. Bring the x over, it becomes 5y is less than negative x plus 20. And then divide by 5, both sides by 5. And then I get this. y is less than or less than negative 1 fifth x. See that? Plus 20 divided by 5 is 4. Okay, so let's graph that. Let's see, this is what the graph looks like. At four is our y intercept. Okay, and then negative one fifth means, remember, down one, right five from this y intercept. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So it looks like that, and it's strictly less than. Right? So that means it's a dotted line. And y is less than, so y is below. So we're gonna shade down there. Doesn't have to be pretty, doesn't have to be perfect, but it is satisfying when you do it a little neater. But that's it. That's not too bad, right? You guys remember doing this in Algebra 1?
think we might have done a little bit this year. I don't know. So that's that's this is what the cool kids are doing. Okay. So you got to put it in slope intercept form and then decide whether you're shading above and below based on the inequality symbol. This says shade. So you can say the word shade when you see the word, when you see Y, shade down or below, shade less than the line. Well, the line is right here. So you're shading less than the line. So that one, it was pretty easy to tell whether it was less than, okay? All right, let's try a little bit more complicated one. It's not too much more complicated. This is one where we have to flip the symbol when you divide by a negative. So see if you guys can graph this. So this is example 3B. I want to graph this guy. So graph, um, where is it? Negative 2Y plus 10X is less than negative 2. So see if you can put that in slope intercept form. So try that right now. And then once you get it in slope intercept form, see if you can graph it. Okay, take a few more seconds here. I'm going to go to GeoGebra. We talked about this. This is a, a nice graphing calculator. And you can go to geogebra.org. I'll put a I'll try to put a link in the uh, in our assignment here. I'll do that right now while I'm waiting. All right, so that's done. Good, good. All right, so back to this. So I'm going to get y by itself. So I'm going to pull this 10x over there. So remember, when you put a variable on the other side, it becomes negative. So negative 2y. I didn't divide by a negative yet. I just subtracted 10x. So really, you're, you don't have to switch the symbol yet. So this is a negative 2. So negative 10x minus 2. Now I'm going to divide by negative two. So when you divide by a negative, remember you have to flip the sign. So this becomes y is now greater than, still do the math, negative 10 divided by negative two is positive five. Negative two divided by negative two is positive one. So here's my graph. Now I have to follow slope intercept. So here's my slope, five over one. My intercept is at one. Okay, so five over one means up five over one. Up five, another one, so it's about right there. Oops, what did I do wrong? Oh, the line should be dotted. Yeah, the line should be dotted because it's strictly greater than, so I'm gonna make that dotted. Okay. Now, can you tell what's on top? Because we want to shade above, right? Because it's a greater than. Can you tell which side is above it and which is below it? If you can't, because some of you guys, if you're like me and have a little bit of exlestia, then you could, uh, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to tell, okay? So just pick a point. See if zero, zero makes this true. Is zero greater than one? No, it's not. So you're going to shade 
over here. Okay. All right. Now, the moment you've been waiting for, let's look up. I'm going to stop this share and I'm going to go into um, my GeoGebra. So here's my GeoGebra site and I put a link here. So we're just going to type in um, our equation. Y is what was it? Y is greater than 5x plus 1. And there it is. Isn't that pretty? It, it calculates as you type, so you don't even have to press Enter. Can you guys see that graph? So you can check your work like this on a graph, but obviously don't rely completely on this. This will do a lot of this your homework for you if you let it. But See if you can learn it yourself. You need to be able to do this on a test. So you can check your work with GeoGebra, or if you have an actual graphing calculator, you can um, check your work on your graphing calculator, but you need to know how to do this without your help as well, okay? All right, so that's the last part of that lesson is just using a graphing calculator. Um, now, let me just show you one more example of when you get a, uh, when you have something like this, if you were to graph this, graph <clears throat> x is greater than or equal to four, well, what does that graph look like? Well, remember when it's x equals something, it is a vertical line. So this is what the line looks like, okay? But then greater than or equal to, well, this time you're talking about x's. Well, in x language, greater than is to the right of. So you're just going to shade over there. Or again, just use the origin. Is zero less greater than or equal to four? No, it's not. So it can't be part of the shading. Okay. <clears throat> so that's about it for lesson 39. Any questions with lesson 39? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Let's do lesson 40. Um, while we're waiting, uh, make sure you Zoom message me, or not Zoom message me, message me if you want to do a Zoom call with uh, uh, test corrections. We can go through your test corrections. I'll give you half your points back up to 15 points back um, if you do a Zoom call with me, um, but if you want to just do test corrections on your own, I'll give you half credit back up to 10 points, okay? So um, if you need 15 points, then that means you probably scored lower than you wanted to. So please do a Zoom, schedule a Zoom call with me, all right? Um, it's, it really won't take long, depending on how much you missed. If you missed every single question, then it, it'll probably only take an hour. OK, but if you missed half the questions, I mean, it's it's not it's really not that much. OK, so what is that? Three minutes a question that we have to go over on average. So it doesn't it's not going to take too much time. OK, and it's worth it because I'm pretty confident that I can get you on track. If you're missing some concepts, then we can figure it out. OK, all right, let's do less than 40. Lesson 40 is simplifying radical expressions. I love these, and I know some of you do too. I'm not even going to ask you if you do, because I just know that you do. So this is just like reducing radicals. So remember, when you reduce fractions, sometimes you can do it in one step if you figure out what the biggest number goes into the top and the bottom number when you're reducing fractions. Or you can do it in chunks. Keep some of you guys do that when you reduce fractions, just keep dividing by two or three or whatever until you get it down to the lowest terms. You can do that with radicals too. Um, but it, the more you do that, the more potential mistakes you're gonna make. Like my pre-algebra and math seven students are getting those problems wrong because they're reducing because it takes like three or four times to reduce it to lowest terms. And, and then they make a mistake because they divide wrong or something. And so. 
Try to eliminate that by just doing it in one step and we can do that. Okay. So there's a lot of uh, um, terminology in the beginning of 40. We talk about square roots. So the principal square root um, to indicate that the positive or principal square root. When I say the square root of 16, remember there's two, there's four or negative four, right? Because technically when you take the square root of something, you're talking about the, there, there's always two answers. But in this case, we're just gonna assume we're talking about the positive square root. Unless I ask for both roots, just give me the positive. This is also called the principal square root, the positive version, okay? So then we got this guy, the radical symbol. So that's the, we just call it a radical. The whole thing is called a radical, but, um, or radical expressions. That's the radical symbol, but I usually call this a radical. Okay. And then this is the radicand. There's no radicant, just a radicand. Okay. That's what you're square rooting. All right. All right. So um, you can do the same thing with other roots. Like if you found the cubed root of eight. That's just two. So not, there is no negative version of that. But if you did like a fourth root of something like 16, that could be two or negative two as well. So whenever you do the even root, there's always two answers, but an odd root, there's only one. Okay. This is stuff that you guys already know, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll keep going here. So let's just jump into some examples. So this is just, basic, this is pre-algebra stuff. Example 1a, if I want to take the fifth root of negative 32, then I want to know what times itself, what times itself five times equals negative 32. Can you do that in your head? And that's where it stays in your head, I guess. Right, negative two, because negative two times negative two times negative two times negative two times negative two is 30 neg is negative 32. So you don't have to worry about negatives. When you're taking the fifth root of a negative number, your answer is going to be negative. Any odd root of a negative number, your answer is going to be negative. Only negative. There's no positive version of that. And then just find the fifth root of 32, which is two. So negative two. All right, what about this? So here's B. What's the third root of 27? Well, there's only one and it's three. Okay, what about C? What's the fourth root of 16? Okay, well, technically it would be two or negative two. So remember when there's an even root, it's either two or negative two, okay? Okay, so here's what's important to, to understand the solution is two, technically two or negative two, but it's just two because although the negative two is a fourth root of 16, the radical sign indicates that only the positive root is to be given, okay? So when you just have a radical sign here, this means just positive root, okay? Don't give me both roots. Now, if I say this, x squared equals 16, find x, then the answer is four or negative four, okay? But if I'm just, if you just see this expression, just give me the positive root, okay? All right, um, let's go to another page here. So the product rule, for radical expressions, product rule for radicals um, is reversible. So basically, if I say uh, A and B are real numbers, N is an integer. So I could say square root of A times the square root of B 
equals the square root of A times B, okay? And vice versa, square root of AB equals the square root of A times the square root of B. So if there's a product underneath the radical, you can break that up into two different radicals that are multiplied by each other. And vice versa, if you have two, mul two radicals multiplied by each other, then you can make it into one big radical. So multiply them inside the radical as well, that works. But technically the rule is um, for the nth root. So this works for any root. So this, the nth root of AB is equal to the nth root of A times the nth root of B. It doesn't have to just be square roots. It could be cubed roots or, or fourth roots or fifth roots or anything like that, okay? So in other words, I could say like the square root of 10 equals the square root of two times the square root of five, right? I could say that, no problem. This doesn't really help me because I, can't, I still can't find the square root of two and the square root of five. Um, but I could say like the square root of 20 is the square root of four times the square root of five, right? But what's the square root of four? That's just two times the square root of five. So this is called a simplified radical because basically there was a square hiding inside of this radical. Squares do not belong inside of radicals. That needs to be simplified. So hunt it down and drag it out, take his mask off. This is what he looks like, okay? So the square root of four was hiding in there. So two is hiding in there masquerading as a square root of four. So hunt down any squares, take them out of the radical. When they come out of the radical, their true identity is revealed. It's just a two, okay? All right, we're gonna simplify this expression here. This is example 2a. We're gonna go square root of eight times the square root of five. Well, let's apply the product rule. Square root of eight times the square root of five is the square root of eight times five, which is the square root of 40. So far, so good. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Now, you know, like the magic question for factoring trinomials and things like that, but there's a magic question for reducing fractions too. What divides out of both the top and the bottom? Well, there's a magic question for reducing radicals. Here's the magic question. What perfect square Remember, perfect squares are like 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, can be divided out of, in this case, it's 40. Okay, so what perfect square can be divided out of 40? Well, the only one I can think of is 4. So see how this is kind of like a factor tree. You don't have to do this like a fact, don't keep going. I think this confuses people actually, I'm gonna undo that. So don't do the factor tree stuff. Just rewrite this as square root of four times the square root of 10. Because with factor tree stuff, you just keep going. Don't keep going. Just find the perfect square and simplify the radical. So this is a square root of four, that's just two times radical 10. Now keep asking, is there a, Perfect square, I can divide out of 10? Well, no, there's only a couple perfect squares under 10 of four and nine, and those don't go into 10, okay? So this is your final simplified answer. All right, now this stuff is stuff you've already done. You've done this in algebra one, you've done it already this year, I think. Um, but let's try one that you haven't done. Here's example 2b. and it's the cubed root of 54. So now our question changes a little bit. What cube can be divided out of 54? Well, let's list our cubes. Here's our cubes. One is always one, and then let's see, eight, two cubed is eight, three cubed is 27, four cubed is 64, and now we're above 64. So now it's one of these. What goes into 54? 27 does. So this is the cubed root of 27. 
times the cubed root of two. Cubed root of 27 is just three times the cubed root of two. Okay, it works the same way as reducing or simplifying square root radicals. You can simplify cubed root radicals the same way. Look for a cube that goes in there. So what I do, and this might be helpful for some of you, what I do in my head is this. I say, oh, okay, let's see, um, 27 can get pulled out and it becomes a three, and then I'm left with two in the radical. Okay, this is what I do in my head. I see 27, so I pull it out, it's a three, and then what's left in there, a two. It's kind of a little to remember, but it might be easier to write it out like this. So everyone thinks differently. Oops, undo. Okay, so when I pull this out, it becomes a three, and then I'm left with cubed root of two in, in the radical, okay? So uh, you can do it however way you want, whatever gives you the most success. It doesn't really matter what you do, um, just get her done. And you can always check this on a calculator by just calculating the cube root of two times three and see if you get the same answer as the cube root of 54. So you can check this, it's easy to check. So don't move on to the next question until you check it. All right, one more example. Let's do square root of 567. All right, now some real challenge here. This is 2C. Square root of 567. Okay, so now you have to ask yourself, what is the biggest square that goes into 567? Anybody have an idea? So remember our squares are one, four, nine, 16. Oops, forgot 25. 25 doesn't go in there, right? Um, even numbers don't go into odd numbers. So it's gotta be something. Anyone have an idea? Well, you could do this in a couple steps. I know that nine goes in there. You guys know the shortcut for knowing if nine goes in there? Add up the digits, it equals 18, nine goes into 18. So yeah, so square root of nine times the square root of 63, okay? So what's the square root of nine? Three, Three. but look. What's the square to 63? There's a square that is in 63. What goes into 63? Well, nine does. So this is a square to nine times a square to seven. What's the square to nine? Three, so three times three times a square to seven, which is just nine times a square to seven, okay? The other way to do this is, um, well, I could have just realized that 81 goes in there. Let's see, does it? I think it does. 81. Yeah, so 81 goes in there seven times. This is one way to do it. So this is kind of like reducing the fraction in multiple steps. It's better to say what is the biggest square in in 567. Well, 81 goes in there. So square root of 567 is the square root of 81 times the square root of seven. What's the square root of 81? Nine. See, that's much easier. If you can find the biggest square, then you just have to do it in one step, okay? Both of these will give you the same answer. Both of these are, the, are right. This is just the better way to do it. Find the biggest square, not just any square, the biggest square that goes into 567. So grab, keep your calculator handy, see if these, and remember you're only checking your odd squares because odd numbers can only go into odd numbers, okay? All right, so you're just looking for 25, you know 25 doesn't go into 567. 
49 maybe divided by 49 see if it goes in 81 you only have to test a few more there's only a few more squares that are less than 567 anyway okay all right so moving on let's uh this is this is basic algebra one stuff so don't stress about this here's example 3a we're just going to combine and simplify. So we're going to combine radical expressions. So you can only combine like radicals. So you can only combine like cubes together and square roots together, but you can only uh, combine the same types of cubic radicals and square radicals. Okay. So this is, these are kind of like variables, right? So these guys are like terms and these guys are like terms. So you can combine these together. So that's just 11 cubed root of eights. And you can combine these together, 14 square root of eights, okay? Well, you can actually simplify this, right? The cube root of eight is just two. So that's 11 times two and the square root of eight is the square root of four times the square root of two. So that's times two radical two. So then you end up your final answer would be 22 plus 28 radical two. So all I did was simplify that to two radical two because four radical four times radical two is radical eight. So two, because the square root of four is two. So two radical two. So 14 times two radical two is 28 radical two. So just like variables, you can combine like radicals. All right, let's try another one like that, 3B. See if you can do this on your own. So we wanna simplify first and see if we end up with any like radicals. So simplify these individual terms first. See if you can do that. Take a minute and try to simplify this. All these, all these are simplifiable. So remember the magic question, what is the biggest square that goes into 242? What's the biggest square that goes into 72? What's the biggest square that goes into 48? Okay, I'm moving in. So this is just the biggest square that I can see is 121. So that's just 11 radical two, okay? Uh, let's see, this one is the biggest square I can see is 36 times two. So 30, radical 36 times radical two. So that's six radical two. Already we can combine those. Then what's here? Let's see, the radical 16 times radical three. So this is four radical three. So then you're left with 17 radical two minus four radical three, because you can't combine radical twos and radical threes together. So you just have to leave it like that. Okay. All right, that was a good one. A um, Couple more examples and then I think we're done. Fourth root, fourth root of 32 plus fourth root of two plus fourth root of 162. All right, so now we have to look for four fourth powers, okay? So let's see, one, um, uh, 16, 81, let's see, four times four is 16, so 256. All right, that's as much as my brain can handle and there's nothing above that anyway. So let's see, I see that 16 goes into 32. So this is fourth root of 16 times fourth root of two. Fourth root of 16 is just two. So this is two times the fourth root of two. 
plus one times the fourth root of two. So these can be combined for sure. Let's see if this works. Uh, 81 goes in there. So this is fourth root of 81 times the fourth root of two. So fourth root of 81 is three. So plus three times the fourth root of two. These are all like terms. So you combine them all together. Two plus one plus three is six times the fourth root of two. That worked out nicely, nice. Okay, um, so now the really probably the most challenging, not the most challenging, I mean, some of you guys might think this is a lot easier, but now when we involve variables in here, we still ask that same question. So the same question is, um, what is the biggest square we can take out of there? Well, this is just square x squared times x squared or when you are square rooting something, you just divide it by two. What times itself equals um, x to the fourth? Well, x squared times itself equals x to the fourth. Okay, so this, so all you're doing is dividing it by two. So another one, and here's another one, x to the square to x to the uh, eighth, or yeah, let's try 12 x to the 12th. Well, what times itself equals x to the 12th? x to the 6th. Well, just divide it by 2, x to the 6th, OK? Well, what happens when it's not a nice number like that? What if it's like x to the uh, 13th? What's the square root of x to the 13th? Well, you still ask yourself, what is the biggest square in x to the 13th. Well, in variable terms, the square is any even exponent. A, a, a variable with an even exponent is square rootable. Because remember, you define the square root of, of an exponential expression, you just divide the exponent by two. Even exponent. OK, well, what's the biggest even exponent in here? x to the 12th, right? So what's the square root of x to the 12th? x to the 6th. So you're left with x to the 6th times the square root of what was left in there, x. OK? So that can be a little confusing for people. But really, you, it takes the pressure off trying to find the biggest square. You're really just looking for the biggest even exponent that you can take out of there, and you're just left with 1. OK, so let's combine it with this example, 4b. Let's try to find the square root, simplify the square root of 18h to the 17th. Okay, you're still asking yourself, what are the biggest squares that you can take out? Well, you can take out uh, a nine, square root of nine, and you can take out square root of h to the 16th, the biggest even exponent. And what are you left with? Square root of two, square root of h. So this all equals square root of 18 h to the 17th. So these are the perfect biggest squares that I can take out. And I can simplify that to 3 h to the 8th. And then what I'm left with underneath the radical is 2 h. OK, another way to think about this is just separate it in just two radicals, 18 h to the 17th. Put your perfect squares over here and your non-perfect squares over here. So this is the square root of 9h to the 16th. And then your non-perfect square of what you're left with is 2 and h. So then this simplifies to just 3h to the 8th times the square root of 2h. So either way works. OK, uh, one more example like this, and then we're done. So here's example 4d. Let's simplify this. Fourth root of 16 x squared plus square root of 4x plus the cubed root of 27. Oh, this doesn't look too difficult. So the only weird one is this guy over here. Um, but let's do it the same way we've been doing. Separate this into squares and not squares. So what are the squares 
of this, well, this is just the square root of 16, or uh, sorry, fourth. The only fourth power in here is 16. X squared is not a fourth power. It's a square, but it's not a fourth power. So you're left with just fourth root of X squared here. Okay, and what about here? Let's see here. What are, what's the, what are the squares that are inside here? Well, that's just square root of four. And what's not square is the X. Okay, and then over here, there's, there's only one cubed root. And it's the whole thing. There's no non-perfect non cubes there. So let's, let's simplify this. Fourth root of 16 is two. And then you're just left with this weird fourth root of x squared. Sorry, one second here. OK, and then we're, we're going to deal with that in a second. Plus 2 times the square root of x plus 3, OK? Because the cubed root of 27 is 3. All right, now, here's what's weird. So I don't know if you guys remember fractional exponents. Did we talk about fractional exponents or not? Can you shake your head yes or no, fractional exponents? Yes, okay, so this is just x to the two over four, right? Because the top, no, top number is the power and the bottom number is the root. Well, what's this reduced to? That's x to the one half. So this is two times the square root of x plus two times the square root of x plus three, combine these terms together, four radical x plus three, okay? So if you get this far, that's awesome. If you get this far, that's more of a bonus, okay? If we have something like this on a test, then we'll go over it in detail before you take the test. But for now, if you see your answer key and you're like, wait a minute, that looks different, that's why because you can reduce this radical expression to just square root of x. Okay, um, so that's it for now. Um, message me if you have questions, but, uh, and message me if you wanna do Zoom, schedule a Zoom call, but uh, that's it, all right? You guys good, any questions? Okay, awesome job. <laughs> We will see you on Thursday.